Hello and welcome to Iyer Thinker, where international affairs are discussed. I'm Martin Zupko. Today we're going to speak about the Wagner Group, Yevgeny Prigozhin, Russia, international military contractors, Russian military contractors, and Ukraine, and also the meaning of Yevgeny Prigozhin for Russia as we go through different sections of the interview. Today I'm joined by Dr. John Bruni. John, hello. Hi, Martin, and uh, greetings to your audience as well from very wintry Adelaide in South Australia. Great, thank you. Dr. John Bruni is an accomplished researcher, analyst, and engaged in podcaster in the military and intelligence sectors. Also, John was a lecturer at the University of Adelaide in 2001 and 2006. He is an analyst and contributor to James, which is a company established 120 years ago delivering open source intelligence across military capabilities. He is also a fellow at the Trends Research and Advisory Institute in Abu Dhabi. And finally, he is a founder and CEO of the Sage International, an Australian independent think tank specializing in defense, space, security, and international relations. So John is going to tell us a few perspectives and facts about the Wagner groups. And let's start with the first section. And in this section, we're going to speak about Wagner's in a general sense. How did the Wagner group come about? And what or who propelled Yevgeny Prigozhin to the position of being the boss of the group? Well, it's an interesting story, uh, Martin, and thank you for the, your generous introduction. Um, one of the things that I think the Western media seems to be forgetting is that Evgeny uh, Prigozhin, while he has been financing the Wagner Group for quite some time before he became a noted leader of this group, the actual person who founded Wagner was uh, Dmitry Utkin. Now, Dmitry Utkin was a Russian army officer, and he served as a special forces officer in the GRU, which is a Russian intelligence. Um, and from there, he uh, founded a, or was part of the Slavonic Corps initially, which was a private military company that started off in, I think, 2013, if memory serves me correctly. Then, of course, uh, he thought that he could do better and founded Wagner. Um, and of course, uh, Wagner was his call sign. Now, Utkin has a bit of an interesting past. From what we can understand on the open source intelligence, he was very, um, I don't like casting aspersions on people, but he did seem to admire the Nazi regime. Uh, he was very strong in his views with regard to militarism, where Russia came from, where Russia should be going, and so on and so forth. So uh, he he splintered off from the Sl uh, Slavonic Corps. And of course, Wagner really developed its name as far as the West is concerned during the, um, uh, the capture of Crimea in 2014. This is when we in the West really started to know something about Wagner, although it was still a very shadowy organization um, at, that, at that period of time. Um, with regard to uh, Prigozhin, well, it wasn't until September of 2022 that Prigozhin stepped into the limelight and claimed leadership of the Wagner Group. But from a Western media perspective, because obviously a lot of people who are in journalism don't necessarily have the capacity to understand the complexities of what's going on in Ukraine, they tend to just overlook the big picture and just focus on the man of the moment. And of course, the man of the moment is Yevgeny Prigozhin. There is a slightly a contrasty view because the, Yevgeny Prigozhin is presented as a chef of Putin because he has, yes. the, he has the restaurant. But on the other yes. hand, at the moment, Prigozhin is portrayed as a military strategist. So does he mm. have any military background or, or you know, that's, that sort of military thinking? Well, Martin, I, uh, his background is actually quite checkered. He served 10 years in uh, a Russian penitentiary uh, for having apparently robbed a bank. Um, and from that point on, when he got released uh, during the turbulent 1990s, he got released from his, uh, from his uh, uh, incarceration. 
and then went on to set up a bunch of uh, hot dog stands. And it was through his hot dog stands that he then became, well, he rose to the position of being Putin's chef. Um, and he was a good networker. The one thing that we can give uh, Prigozhin was he had an eye for where he saw himself being in the future. So he could pinpoint the various people that he needed to make friends with, which allowed him to rapidly rise up in Putin's estimation, being Putin's chef, obviously, and then afterwards being a, a trusted, uh, do we say military? I'd say paramilitary person uh, with the Wagner group. Yeah. So basically, um, you know, uh, Prigozhin has no real military background as we would understand it. Um, I think he leveraged off a lot of uh, Dmitry Utkin's specialization, and he kind of found his feet as the Wagner head. Um, so really, I think he was one of those people that basically learned the military art as he was growing his reputation within Wagner and among Putin's inner circle. And what happened with Utkin? Well, uh, there were a number of restrictive measures placed upon him. He's still alive, as far as we understand, but uh, there have been a number of um, restrictive um, uh, measures placed against him by the Council of Europe and the United States for alleged human rights atrocities that Utkin was alleged to have committed uh, through Wagner operations based outside of Russia, uh, especially in, in the Syrian area. So... Um, his his fate, well, you know, like with most things in Russia, Russia being an opaque society, is um, it, it's uh, unknown, shall we say? <laughs> I see. So that that's you know explains a lot because when when we watch those uh, videos with Prigozhin and he recruited people from prisons, so that that mm. makes sense, you know, that he knew how to work with prisoners. So I yes. think that that's sort of like point. Because many people, they don't know why he went to prisons to recruit people, mm. if he can get mm. also like regular people for the for the money, you know. So that's quite interesting fact to know. When you mention those uh, missions, we know about Crimea, but are there any missions that are worth of mentioning of Wagner? Well, look, really, uh, yes, uh, Martin, the, the most important one after Crimea really was their deployment into Syria, but they've been deployed uh, to various other places, uh, Libya, the Central African Republic, Mali, Yemen, they've been all over the place and they've done a lot to, I wouldn't say stabilize the local situation, but certainly uh, they do have a training cadre. So what they do is they go into various areas, uh, commit whatever acts uh, the local forces can't commit to um, in terms of uh, not wanting them to be exposed to international law with regard to human rights and so on and so forth. So the Wagner Group in Australia, we have this thing called um, it's it's a. Uh, it's a little saying that we have, you know, for people who are really hard, we call them toe cutters. So if you if you see the Wagner group uh, from a Russian perspective, from an Australian perspective, we call them the toe cutters. They, they obey no real law, um, but they are being directed from Moscow to carry out Russia's national security interests abroad. And they have a very broad remit. They can do whatever is necessary to make sure that Russian interests are being taken care of in far-flung places. So in terms of um, uh, obeying the rules of war, well, you know, that could be something that the Russian army would be very um, mindful of. You know, they don't want to necessarily be brought before The Hague to stand trial for war crimes. I mean, we, we do know that there's a huge gray area in terms of you know, the Geneva Conventions on the one side and what actually happens in war on another. But I think that that is a, a legal consideration that even the Russian army, in spite of what has happened in Ukraine, would be slightly aware of and would be trying to not push the barrow too hard on. Wagner, on the other hand, they're like the pit bull dog that is completely unleash, unleashed with rabies. So if you can imagine the worst possible person with a weapon coming after you en masse, that would be the Wagner group. And I suppose that also shows the success of the organization as well. They do things that others would not want to do or 
uh, who or what what that they fear to do. So Wagner has no fear. I think they are. Um, I think one of their uh, uh, visual representations is of someone holding a sledgehammer after slamming the sledgehammer in the side of someone's head. I mean, this is the kind of organization we're talking about when we are dealing with Wagner. Take right. no prisoners. Mm. Two questions from my students, and, and that's sort of something that needs to be clarified. The first one, when we speak about the Wagner members, are those people Russians only, or are there any people from you know different countries? And the second question, which is quite interesting from students, how mm. do Wagner mercenaries travel? Because you mentioned you know, yeah. Syria, you mentioned African countries, now they are, they were in Ukraine. So like people don't understand how they travel because it's like, not like three, four people, but there's like 10,000 or 5,000 people. So how the private military mercenaries, Wagner's, how they move from mission to mission? Question of how Wagner mercenary, uh, mercenaries travel. Well, you know, um, the Ukrainians seem to have this idea that Wagner mercenaries are issued international travel passports, and it's done through a specific Moscow-based passport desk that issues fake identity papers. And that's how Wagner forces go, uh, go abroad. Also, when they go abroad, they don't go onto a military transport or, or hire a massive plane and just you know take a bunch of Wagner forces across. They go in small batches that are not conspicuous. And then they, you know, come together in their destinations. So it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a multifarious way of doing things, but it seems to work well for them, and it allows them to extend their football print. There have been some recruits that come from Syria. There have been some recruits that come from Libya, uh, and I think that there are a few African recruits as well, probably coming from the countries that Wagner has engaged with that we have mentioned, the Central African Republic and Mali as well. So, you know, Wagner is kind of international. Um, as far as the Russians are concerned, we're, we'd be talking about Russians in far-flung places. We would not be talking about upper-middle-class people from St. Petersburg or Moscow. So we'd be looking at uh, poorer Russian communities, poorer Russian republics, further beyond the Urals. That seems to be what... Putin is aiming for in terms of their overall Russian army recruitment. I don't see anything less in terms of Wagner. But of course, when we talk about Wagner and its structure, one thing that we have to also uh, talk about too is the fact that Wagner is very much a bifurc uh, bifurcated structure. You've got some very solid former military operators who operate within the Wagner domain. And then you have the expendables, you know, the prisoners, the poor recruits that have come from those outlying areas looking for a little bit of money and a bit of respect or whatever they're looking for. And then you have your, you know, individual psycho who decides to sign up and do some nasty things because, you know, the pay is good and that's what they like to do. So you've got a real mix in Wagner. Um, one of the other things that I think is really important to note too is that when we talk about Wagner, we're not talking about an organization like the Russian army. Wagner is not the Russian army. Wagner is a paramilitary organization that has a very fluid internal structure. They don't have any organized uh, real command chain like an army does. It has a command chain, but it's not as sol solidified, if you will. So, you know, people can wear multiple hats within Wagner in a way that they can't do in the Russian army, which is far more specialized and far more hierarchical in structure. Okay. And how do people or how does Wagner Group buy equipment? For instance, they need night vision goggles or, you know, those high tech things. And they are pretty pricey, like $5,000, $10,000. Yeah. They, they want to buy yeah. some military, you know, rifles or, or equipment, you know. How does it work? Because military market is quite organized unless you're going through the sort of shadow waters. So how is it? Oh, well, I think you've just answered the question, haven't you? They do go through uh, a lot of black market channels to get what they need to get. Um, the Russian army obviously does supply Wagner in the in the uh, Ukrainian theater. Um, I would argue that a lot of Wagner's equipment does come from Russian sources, even those who are deployed abroad, especially in Libya and Syria. 
Um, further afield, I think that they will just make do with whatever they can get through the third party clients. Like for instance, if they're operating in Mali, you know, they'll they'll purloin what they can from local sources they'll also buy what they need from the black market you know and of course the black market as you know they'll they'll have a markup on costs but it's important for your audience to understand that wagner is a very profitable enterprise it is a private enterprise it's a private military company uh yevgeny prigozhin is a billionaire so if he thinks that there are any shortfalls within wagner ranks in a critical location I'm sure he'll be able to find the monies necessary to afford to buy in uh, specialist equipment. I don't think that that is a problem for Wagner currently. Um, it may very well be a problem for Wagner, as, you know, if uh, Putin manages to crack down on Wagner and reintegrate Wagner forces within the Russian army, as has been suggested. But we can go into that a little bit later. That also explains that experience of Prigozhin of being in prison, because we know the prison is one of the best places where you can learn how to earn loyalty, you know, like how to pay oh, yeah. for something and how to get something, you know, even if it's prohibited. So mm. let's compare philosophically or in the military science the differences between Wagner mm. Group and the Western military, private military contractors, for instance, Constalin's mm. Holdings, which, you know, which represents basically the Black Rock. All right. Well, I know the way that the West tends to operate with private military companies is that in many locations, not necessarily the United States, and we'll go into that in a second, but in many locations, private military companies are frowned upon. And legally, there are preventative measures put into place uh, to prevent the formation of private military companies and also prevent private military companies to openly recruit in various countries. Um, but in the United States, in the case of the United States, where everything is very much based on a neoliberal economic model, um, the, the legal uh, aspect surrounding private military companies is far more fluid. Um, it's not as constrained as they would be in many European countries, certainly in Australia. Um, um, I would say probably Britain's a bit of an outlier in the European context because they have got a, uh, a very long and torrid history dealing with private military companies. Um, but in the United States, what has happened, and your audience may know this, during the 1990s, there has been a lot of downsizing of the American military in terms of personnel numbers. And the downsizing uh, came with restructuring. And the restructuring meant that why do we need to pay for people in uniform who are directly under an officer to organize logistics? Logistics is far better handled by private enterprise. It's much more efficient, much more effective. So why don't we buy in that skill into the army and soldiers will therefore just be soldiers. They'll just go out and fight, and the logistics will be provided by a private military company or a private company of some description. So what you'll see in the United States is PMCs are far more embedded within the American military structure, even though there, and as well as the fact that there is that sort of legal ambiguity in terms of where they all sit. With regard to Russia, Wagner and other companies officially don't have any role in society, and they are there at the beck and call of the Russian president. If the Russian president believes that a private military company is useful to the extension of Russian national interests, they will bend the law any which way they need to ensure that Russia's national interest can be protected overseas. And it also gives the Russian military this thing called plausible deniability. That is that we in the West may suspect that the Russians are on the move in places in Africa or in Latin America, but we have no real proof because it's a private military company and Russia can sit back and say, well, they're private. They're not us. We're not paying them. The trick of this with regard to Wagner is that, um, you know, after the Prigozhin uh, military putsch, um, Putin came out and said, we own Wagner now. And, you know, when that uh, announcement came out, I thought to myself, well, there there goes your plausible den deniability. That's gone out the window because now that you've confessed that you fund Wagner, you organize Wagner and the Russian state owns Wagner, that means that you not only own it now, but you must also retrospectively and 
legally own all of the atrocities that Wagner had committed since the organization has has been founded, which from a Western legal tradition would put Wagner in the spotlight. But of course, in Russia, they could do what they like because they're not in that spotlight. However, it's a movable feast right now, Martin. We don't know exactly how this is going to play out. There were announcements made immediately after the Prigozhin military uh, putsch, as well as, uh, oh well, well, one of the things that they 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 specifically said was that Wagner will be folded back into the Russian military. It will be broken up around the world, and Wagner fighters had the responsibility for handing over their heavy military equipment to the Russian army on the 1st of July. Well, today is the 6th of July, and I have not seen a major news story in the West covering the handover of Wagner's heavy military equipment. So what does that mean for us? Well, one of two things. Prigozhin, well, he's apparently in exile in Belarus and is alive for the moment, uh, Wagner forces, some of them, have fled into exile with Prigozhin, and the fate of Wagner's heavy military equipment seems to be unclear. What does that mean? Martin, your guess will be as good as mine. <laughs> I see. Can I just go back to what you said about Putin admitting the ownership of the Wagner group? It seems like a strategic mistake, you know, because, like, if I were the president, I would just say, you know, like, I don't comment on that issue or, or something like that. So I, I, I will leave it. But maybe yeah. I'm mistaken, but is there any strategic advantage of admitting this or not? I, I've been agonizing over this for quite some time. And, and it's it, it falls into something that is, again, am, am, ambiguous with regard to the Putin regime. He's done a lot of things, which if I was in his, if I was in his position, oh, should I say this publicly? Feel free to cut this out if it comes across too strong, but just for argument's sake, if I was dictator of Russia, there were a lot of things that I would have done differently from Vladimir Putin. The first thing is I would have shot Wagner publicly in Red Square. End of story. The second thing I would have done is exactly what you said. I would not have owned Wagner. Wagner still has utility. You could, you know, if you if you remove Prigozhin and you take out his supporters in a purge, you can still use Wagner as a plausibly deniable group of people doing the nasty in parts of the world for the Russian state without admitting ownership of that. So I think that in many ways, I do not understand why Putin did what he did. Uh, similarly, why has Putin got Alexei Navalny alive in a, in a prison cell? Some people have said to me, oh, but John, that's clever politics because he can slowly be broken. Well, you know, if you we we had uh, on one of our uh, on one of our podcasts only recently we had the pleasure of um, speaking to um, uh, Vlad Vexler, and I don't know if your um, uh, your audience knows about Vlad Vexler, but maybe you can put a link to his channel also in the show notes. He's a very interesting guy, and you know when we were talking about uh, uh, this this notion of uh, Navalny and just having him in the corner again, you know, this is you know we we, we touched on this issue and it, it it made sense, but it didn't make sense. Why keep a political opponent alive when the likelihood of him becoming a lightning rod of political discontent in prison in Russia is very high, and if things are starting to turn against Putin right now. You know, the sooner you get rid of your political opponents, like Prigozhin on the one side and Navalny on the other, the sooner you can reconsolidate your position. I mean, this is this is dictatorship 101 we're talking about, right? So I, I'm with you and I understand what you're saying with regard to, well, it wasn't probably a very good idea, but, you know, Putin is a cunning uh, politician and you know, perhaps there is method in his madness and only time will tell. Also, when it comes to Navalny and Russian prisons, and everyone who is studying Russia a little bit knows that it's almost impossible to have a contact from Russian prison to the world. And we know mm. Navalny is on Twitter and, and all those things going around. So, <laughs> you know, in terms of, of being in the inside of Vladimir Putin's mind, you know, I would stop this, you know, immediately. You know, I wouldn't allow those things to be going on and, and 
been basically broadcasting to the world. So that's also quite of interesting fact to research for my students and also the international audience. So let's go back to Ukraine. And for some students, it's unclear what's the proper military model of Russian army and the Wagner group being on one battlefield. Because even the hardcore Russian propagandists, they are saying that the situation in Ukraine is not going as expected. So we can ask from different perspective, what was expected from this cooperation in Ukraine? This is a very interesting question. Um, but as we said before, the army is a different institution. It has different responsibilities to the state of Russia. And it can't be seen to be a horrific institution of force. I mean, it is a horrific institution of force. And if if you're on the Ukrainian side of things, you just want these guys out because they're doing terrible things. But if you put a Wagner soul, a, a Wagner fighter, I should say, they're not soldiers, they're paramilitaries. You put a, a Wagner paramilitary next to a Russian soldier. Most of the Russian soldiers are poorly trained, ill-equipped conscripts. And conscripts, you know, they may be ordered to do bad things on behalf of their country, but sometimes they simply don't carry the, those orders out. Sometimes they do. It's a, it's a gray area. But with Wagner, there's no gray, gray area. It's just black. They will do what the conscript won't do. And this is the significant difference. There is a an element of terror that Wagner paramilitaries instill in Ukrainians that the Russian army doesn't. I mean, we can even see this in the propaganda that comes out of Ukraine. You know, um, since the invasion, the standing Russian army has been humiliated. And the Ukrainians are making a big lunch out of this. You know, they're making a big propaganda festival of the fact that, you know, the Russian army is incompetent, they can't fight correctly. But oh my God, those Wagner people, did you see what they did in Solidar? Did you see what they did in Bakhmut? You know, that is a different sort of fight that Wagner brings to the table, a fight that the Russian army may want to benefit from, but may not want to prosecute themselves. Right. Yeah, it is different because when, when you see pictures from Bakhmut or those cities, it's like wiping everything out of this world, including people, yeah. children, women, souls, yeah. houses, everything. So it's it's Absolutely. it's a completely, you know, it's it's un unbelievable what they what they could do, mm -hmm. you know. So mm -hmm. that's that's a quite a fascinating story. But when there is a target, a military target, for instance, a house, a building, a missile storage facility. Who is going to decide if Russian army is going to destroy or Wagner's are going to destroy? Is there sort of like one synergy of communication between these two groups or how does it work in practice? From what we understand, the ultimate decision will always be a Russian army decision. They will make the decision to place Wagner forces in a particular location on a battlefield because it benefits them to do so, because maybe there's some hard fighting that they have no confidence that the Russian army will be able to prosecute. Basically, what we have is we have uh, the Russian army who make the decision where to place Wagner on the battlefield. But from an operational and tactical perspective, the actual fighting, there will be Wagner commanders who will then give the order to their fighters to go off and seize various objectives. So in terms of the minutiae, it's, the, it's at the tactical and the operational level that Wagner commanders have an effect. It's at the strategic level that the Russian army, and you know, the Russian army, including the Russian uh, intelli uh, military intelligence, the GRU, they will feed information when necessary to Wagner so they can be best utilized to break through at a certain location. So really, it, it, it's kind of structured like that, yeah? Okay. And uh, from a bit of a different perspective, do you have any insights what high rank Russian military officers like generals, marshals, admirals, what they think about the Wagner group, like how they receive that they must be on one battlefield with a private military contractor? Yeah, that's, uh, that's interesting. Well, I, I think that they'll, if they had no opinion of Wagner, before 
the mutiny. They certainly have an opinion about Wagner and similar groups after the mutiny. I would think that initially they may have thought that this is a great idea. Uh, they've got a bunch of ne'er-do-well shock troops that they could just like literally throw into the meat grinder without having to expend too much blood in uniform, in proper Russian army uniform. I think that there was this initial, yes, we will support Russian private military companies if they do the nasty, terrible work of actually cutting through and, and you know, giving their version of tactical shock and awe to the Ukrainians. Where it all changed, of course, is, you know, Prigozhin's high-profile character. Prigozhin's not been a wilting flower in terms of what his views are of Russian high command, Russian fighting prowess in the army. And, uh, um, you know, Shoigu, for instance, the um, the Russian uh, Minister for Defense, and you've got uh, uh, Valery Gerasimov, the, um, the Russian uh, Chief of Defense Staff. You know, he, the, these guys... Well, Shoigu in particular, he's got his own private military company. Don't ask me the name. I've just forgotten that one. But he's got his own private military um, uh, company, which is in competition with Wagner. So that was already a match not made in heaven in terms of any strategy or any operational matters that had to be done between these two particular groups, plus the Russian army on top of that. Um, so basically, yes, you, you've got... Um, a very very difficult situation the the i think now with the mutiny and with the fact that progosian is seen as a a bit of a star in his own making he's a very flamboyant mercenary captain i think the closest modern parallel i can give is that after a period of time, mercenary captains or captains of private military companies, they, you know, they're all in it for the money. But there comes a time in certain mercenary outfit evolutions that the captain of the outfit becomes a bit of a superstar in the public space. We saw this once before in a British military, uh, private military company that was working in Africa and was very, very much um, a high profile outfit led by um, Mad Mike Hoare. And Mad Mike Hoare was caught up in the Congo conflict. And, you know, uh, there were the there was a movie made of his exploits called The Wild Geese. Um, uh, so your, your listeners can look that one up. Um, but they lionized uh, Hoare's adventures in Africa. But Hoare's adventures in Africa, when you look at it with a sober eye, they were war crimes, basically, in Africa. Um, but it didn't prevent them from turning him into a bit of a hero figure. Prigozhin seems to have a similar kind of thing where he was always being, he, he's always positioned himself and his group as being the ones looking after Russia's national interest and in an efficient and an effective way, in a way that the Russian army simply couldn't. So as his public profile rose, I think that there was this, this notion that among you know the high command in Russia, this is not a good idea. It's all right if I've got a little pit bull on my leash and I can you know I can pull him back when I think that he's getting a bit above himself and above his station. But Prigozhin was never really pulled in by anybody and was you know unleashed on the telegram stations and ever so often when he was interviewed by other people when he got to a public interview, he said some pretty overtly anti. Putin objective things. That's what I would say. So I think now people are thinking, we can't put the muzzle back on the dog. So what do we do with the dog? We can't shoot it either. Based on what you just said, can you please tell us or can you assess weaknesses and strong points of the Wagner? The strengths were, as we made mention before, they really run by no rules. So they can instill terror on the battlefield in a way that um, average Russian combatants can't. Their weakness, of course, and this is especially so in Ukraine, and it's hard to determine how much of an effect this also has in areas abroad that they've been deployed to, but certainly they have become 
dependent on the Russian army for munitions supplies, for non-lethal equipment supplies, which made them then dependent on the likes of Gerasimov and Shoigu. If, if Gerasimov and Shoigu thought that Wagner was overstepping the mark, they would tighten the supplies. Prigozhin would go onto Telegram and say what a bunch of, you know, whatever's they were, um, and air his disgust at the Russian army. Um, and and th but that that revealed the vulnerability of Prigozhin. Prigozhin was a paramilitary outfit. He didn't have the command of factories that could provide his forces with weapons independent of the Russian army. And so, in that sense, Prig Prigozhin was in a was dealt a pretty weak hand. He played it well, but he you know he he did have a bit of a weak hand here. Where it becomes really tricky is during the mutiny itself, something must have happened within the Russian army because Prigozhin not only took over two major cities, including Rostov-on-Don in the south of Russia, but was allowed to basically get halfway to Moscow before anyone really started mobilizing anything. And this is where it becomes really tricky, you know, like you know, what was the disadvantage there? Someone was obviously backing uh, Prigozhin in the Kremlin. Who those people are, we will not know, certainly not in the immediate term. So it's a move, and, and, and it's a drama still playing out right now. Absolutely. It also points to the meaning of logistics in a, in a modern yes. hybrid conflict, because that sort of logistics, logistics environment and those streams of supplies, you know, you can have the perfect soldier, but if he doesn't have any bullets, what he can do, you know? So that's that's sort of, I think, quite interesting point that, that the meaning yeah. of the logistic in the modern conflict. But when we mention a modern conflict and when we get a little bit above all the perspectives, is there anything that the collective West can learn from Wagner Group in Ukraine in terms of military strategy? Look, I, I think that um, we are learning as we're going, and I think that NATO has done a very good job so far in terms of understanding that the more economic pressure is applied on Russia, the less economic resources Russia has to fund its war. And by funding its war, we're also talking about funding the Wagner Group, um, which arguably could have been one of the contending factors uh, why, of course, in a resource-depleted environment, the Russian army started becoming a little bit more protective over its own resources and not so generous about sharing ammunition, supplies, and various other supplies to Wagner. I mean, we talked about the the, the bad situation between Shoigu, Gerasimov, and, and Prigozhin. That, that covers part of the story. The other part of the story is, had Russia not been hit by so many really tough sanctions by the West, would this argument over resources have ever occurred. Now, that's an interesting point. So when we sit back and, you know, and uh, I know some of my military colleagues will lament the fact that we're not doing enough, we're not providing Ukraine enough weapons and material and not enough in terms of quantity and certainly not enough in terms of time. And I understand those reasons why people are lamenting that. And um, But one of the things that we have to also realize is that the West is fighting a war both at a subtle level and at a proxy level, and the subtle level includes the economic sanctions package, which is now starting to have its effect by getting the heads of this awful invasion to fight among themselves for things that they shouldn't have had to fight among themselves. Because one of the key problems, and it's a problem the West struggles with, so let's be very fair when I, when I raise this. But the international sanctions on Russia has crippled Russia's capacity to produce weapons of sufficient quantity and quality. One of the reasons why the Russians have been, you know, plowing through their stocks of Cold War and, dare I say, even pre-Cold War material uh, to throw into the battlefield right now is because pr the production of modern T-14 Amata tanks requires Western technology, which they do not have now since the war. So without access to Western supplies, the Russians can't build a modern battle tank. 
and whatever they can purloin from among their own resources, because Russia is no longer the Soviet Union. They don't have the industrial plant. They don't have the design bureaus they once had. They don't have the uh, the you know the 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 the, the pr sheer productive capacity of the Soviet Union, they also believed in the Western propaganda of global supply chains. So with global supply chains, no one country produces one thing anymore. You know, one country is a staging base where you produce a little bit, then you ship it off to another place, and then they put another place, uh, another thing into it, and then they ship it to a third country, and then they may manufacture it there, or they may have to transship it elsewhere to do that. So we're we're looking at even countries that want to be seen to be strong can no longer be seen to be strong in the same way as we saw countries being strong in World War II and before World War II, where all nation states around the world were scrambling to find industrial autarky, which means self-sufficiency or self-reliance, you know, in the real sense of the word, not in the, the, the namby-pamby political sense of the word. So Russia has suffered from that. But then Let's go to the West for a moment, just, just to give you a comparison. The West has also done the same thing. And that puts us in a peculiar position because no one Western country can just, you know, give, uh, you know, uh, ammunition, missiles, various supplies to Ukraine because, you know, one particular product is made by five different countries. And those five different countries all have to sink their productive capacities to help produce this one weapon. Now, if you've got that, that's a problem. That's a problem for the West. So what we're doing is we're scrambling around among the things that we've produced for ourselves to hand over to the Ukrainians, which then leaves gaping holes in our own military equipment supplies. So if we ever find ourselves in a war, with what will we fight? You know, Lockheed Martin is a massive producer, but they're stretched to capacity and you think to yourself, well, wow, you know, don't they make billions upon billions upon billions of dollars profit every year by selling weapons? Surely they shouldn't have any productive problems at all. They have massive production problems right now. There are bottlenecks in production because we didn't think in the West that we would ever fight a state on state war. We thought that the only wars of the future would be gray zone wars where most of those hostilities would be done through cyber, which is nothing really. It's a computer terminal and a hacker on the other side. Um, you know, it, it, it doesn't require anyone to throw something uh, in a lethal manner to another country. Um, we thought that maybe spy craft would be upgunned. We thought that all these indirect things would be the future of war with the only real outlier here being perhaps terrorism, like we fought with the global war on terrorism. Well, war is now transformed back into what it used to be in World War II, where it's state v. state. However, the productive capacities of all states on the planet are multifarious. And one country can't just say, well, we're just going to you know, start cranking out the volumes of tanks and missiles and, and artillery shells and whatever the hell we need. I mean, look at the Russians at the moment. They have to buy from Iran the drones that they need to prosecute the war in Ukraine, which is kind of weird because... I don't know about you and your listeners, but I don't believe that Iran is a major producer of anything in particular, certainly not in a technological sense, certainly not in a military technology sense. And as much as the Iranians would like to lionize their industrial efforts, uh, how reliable are these things in comparison to Western sourced items? You know, so yeah, yeah. It, that, that opens many questions. And, and one of the question is the European security architecture the diversity of military equipment because you know Indeed. We, are, we are sending military equipment to ukraine from europe but each mm -hmm. train is a different equipment for different fighting or military environment you need different people to manage that to maintain to yeah. service you know then you have the big competition between the european and american companies what sort of mm -hmm. jets we have so when mm -hmm. when zelensky said you know like oh we need some jets yeah. Which ones? From where? Who is going to pilot them? Who is going to maintain them? So that opens so many questions, you know, that that's, you know, they are very, very interesting questions, especially for research in military sector. And I think mm -hmm. this is one of the big lessons also coming from 
the Wagner's and, and Russian military from Ukraine to learn how to manage own security architecture before helping others. Because once you might get into the stage that you really want to help, but you are not capable of, of providing that help, even if you're willing to help. And this is, yep. you know, it's also connected to the credibility, for instance, credibility of the European Union, credibility of the United States, NATO, how those actors in international relations interact, you know, among each other. So that that's opens many questions. But one question, which is like in my mind, if Wagner's are gone, and we said that officially Wagner's being abolished, who is going to take place in Ukraine that Wagner's had? Because that's a big gap. Uh, yes, there is, but uh, the Russians do have a number of military companies. I think there are about another uh, four other reasonable sized private military companies that they can bring to the fore. Um, but I, I would, I would think that this is an argument that is best left for another time because I don't believe that Wagner has been fully dispatched yet. And until there is more solid evidence with regard to Wagner, I don't think that we are seeing it being wound up. It may it may be um, uh, taken by Putin. It may be shaped or reshaped in some way. It's not clear exactly how that's going to happen. But at the moment, so long as Prigozhin is alive and so long as Wagner has heavy equipment, uh, its utility to the Russian state, it's, it's still there. And, and I think that... One thing that can be said is that Wagner was responsible for Russia's victory in Bakhmut and in Solodar. They have got a good track record of fighting in a way that the other less overt private military companies have demonstrated. And I think that we're too late in the war to pull out Wagner completely from Ukraine in particular, but also from their ongoing commit uh, commitments in Africa and the Middle East and Latin America. I think Wagner is too useful. It's become too useful. And this is and this is where Putin's biggest problem is. You know, you've got a high profile figure in Prigozhin who's who, who just doesn't know how to close his mouth. He, he spouts off constantly. And and look, you know, with um, um, my discussion with uh, Vlad Vexler, you know, we, we spoke at length about Prigozhin as a political actor. Now, Vlad believes that Prigozhin is not a political actor. I tend to suspect that he's right. I, I think that Prigozhin's really only in that for the money and for the prestige. He doesn't seem to have political instincts. You know, um, he's very coarse in his mannerisms. I don't believe he's a strategic thinker at all. I think he's a very he's he's got what we would call uh, cunning on side. He's very cunning individual, uh, street cunning. You know, not not very sophisticated, but he gets a job done. And and I think people within the Russian elite, if they were thinking of threatening Putin in some way, Prigozhin is their stooge to do that. But Prigozhin will never be president of the Russian Federation. I don't believe anyone would trust him within a bull's roar, but they would certainly want to use him. And I suspect that that is why Putin didn't just go after him as quickly as he probably should have. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, maybe he's trying to, but maybe he's trying to actually flush out a deep, a deeper pro-Prigozhin conspiracy in Russia, which would probably be the method that I would do, that I would use if I wasn't going to shoot him immediately. I'd just let Prigozhin dangle there, and I'd wait for all the people who supported him to come and try to pass messages on. And then when I knew that I could grab the whole bunch of them and then shoot them, then I would do that then. So perhaps it's a clever move on behalf of Putin. But again, I think Putin's been shaken. I think his leadership has certainly been undermined hugely by Prigozhin's mutiny. And we just have to wait to see how it plays out. I have a couple of questions about sort of bizarre military conflict in Ukraine from my students. One of them is... Russians, Americans, British, NATO, they all have high-tech satellites, spying yep. networks, and all those facilities, you know, as, as we know. And for some students, it's, it just, they can't understand, how is it possible that the West is supplying the weapons through the routes that Russians or Wagner's were not able to destroy? Because they all have the equipment, they all have the capabilities, 
they can sail a Kinjal missile or, or something, you know, and destroy the railway or the roads. But for some reason, mm. those trains are still coming. Is there any military or military strategic explanation for this? Yeah, well, there is. It's a it's a very simple one and a very basic one. Um, you know, GLONASS, the Russian um, satellite system, is not the same as GPS or not the same as I think it's the Galileo system that the oh, yeah, European yeah. Union. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, not as sophisticated and certainly nowhere close in capacity to anything the West has. And if we're looking at what the Ukrainians are leveraging off at the moment, uh, Elon Musk's Starlink uh, network, I mean, that is just so sophisticated and so outside of Russia's ballywick. You know, they, technologically speaking, the Russians are very far behind. You know, when we talk about Russian satellites, and their capacity to deliver munitions to you know on target i think that the last time that they could really do that w with global reach was during the cold war uh when the americans and the russians had parity in satellites and they were constantly refreshing ground stations software hardware satellites even um the russian economy post-soviet union contracted significantly one of the reasons that you know russia had such a problem in its invasion its initial invasion of ukraine was that yes we have the naked numbers on the piece of paper and you know we will outnumber the ukrainians and just go in blindly just go in because our mass says it all right well yeah okay fine but uh at the end, um, we found out that not enough Russian finance was expended on the right things, the right equipments, the right logistic trains and training. The, the, the Russian logistics was an absolute farce at the uh, at the beginning of the war. And if we go into the you know the the high ground of outer space, you know the same the same amount of degradation post-Soviet Union has happened to Russian satellites. Yeah, there, there are a few operational satellites up there and some operational ground stations, but you can't compare them to what the West has. And that's the reason why, you know, you could make the argument that, okay, they've got the same as the West. Why aren't they fighting better? Well, it's because much of what the Russians came to the party with have been severely degraded um, in spite of their chest-beating exercises. So, so the next question is, when... Um... People live in Russia and outside of Russia, they can see all those videos with the high-tech military equipment. So this question is connected to the previous one. The best raiders, the best military sort of like uh, technology. And, and you can access those videos on YouTube and on basically Russian YouTube without any problem. You are at the war as a country, right? So you can expect some incidents on the border. And still we have news how a drone destroyed the oil facilities in Russia, how a city was attacked from Russia by the drone. So what's happening with the Russian airspace? Is it not sealed or, or what's going on? I mean, it's for me, uh, it's, it's bizarre. Yeah. It is bizarre. Um, uh, this, is the, this is the point that I wanted to get at earlier, actually. Uh, so uh, let's, let's pick up. You were talking earlier off air with regard to Russia's proper, you know, slick propaganda. I mean, it's not like it was in the Soviet Union. Now they've, you know, brought in companies and they've got technology to make, you know, these seamless and very dramatic videos of Russian equipment going about their paces on the battlefield. And it looks very, very good. I mean, I've seen some of them. Uh, the, the production values are fantastic. But if they would have spent, if the Russians would have spent as much money on their actual fighting forces and less on the propaganda aspect, you know, maybe we would be having a different conversation. I'm just putting it out there, but I think that money's poorly spent in an economy that has grandiose visions of what its military can do. You know, you got to be careful with that because now the world has seen what the Russian military is really about. They've seen the vulnerabilities of the Russian military. And this is going to take decades to repair for Russia, for any Russian government in the future. And we know that Putin won't be there in the future. 
<laughs> but you know, if we're talking about uh, repairing Russia's reputational damage, you know, it wasn't that long ago. It was actually before the invasion of uh, twenty-two, uh, February twenty-two. Um, you know, people were saying that Russia had the the second strongest military in the world. Well, gee, you know, it wasn't a lot longer after that we, you know, we we saw exactly the state of the Russian military. And it doesn't matter how many slick propaganda messages go out there showing a different story. If anyone believed that, they're believing in a parallel universe where the Soviet Union still exists, because at the moment, it doesn't. And this is a problem. It's even possible to explain, you know, when Rostov on Don, there is mm. an airbase, the Russian military airbase. And Evgeny Prigozhin with his guys just took it over. And, and I'm thinking, you know, it's, a, it's a, one of the strategic or the most strategic cities in Russia because of the south yeah. position close to the, to the sea. And how is it possible that the private military guys just coming around and say like, hmm, I'm just going to take, take over that, that Russian air base base, you know, like, is it not protected or the paperwork means, oh, there are soldiers, but in reality, maybe there are no soldiers, no special equipment, because, you know, when you watch watch you know some news it's super difficult to get even like half kilometer close to the military base everywhere in the world including small countries or big countries because when you have military base it's super protected so what's your thought about this like how how is it even possible well i think that uh all right the russian army is an extremely bureaucratic top-down driven organization most of Russia's available combat power are in trenches in Ukraine. They initially, when they invaded, ran into major logistical problems in terms of delivering fuel, ammunition, food to the soldiers in the front lines. Some of those issues have been solved, but certainly not all of them. And as your listeners would understand, there is a problem with just packing up a bunch of soldiers who are in de defensive trenches and then getting them to march backwards towards their general headquarters in Rostov-on-Don to arrest Prigozhin and the Wagner group. Now, the Wagner operation, the paramilitary group of private military company, doesn't have is not encumbered by bureaucracy. If Prigozhin has a flea in his head, I want to go and turn my forces here. He could just go and turn his forces here. That's it. End of story. The Russian army doesn't have that capacity to do that. That's why I think they were really caught by surprise. Now, what we need to understand is, were the Russians completely caught by surprise and incapable of moving and blocking Prigozhin's entrance into Rostov-on-Don and further up the chain toward Moscow? And if that's the case, that reveals another glaring problem of the russian military and you're absolutely right to point out the fact that you know the 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 russian air force has been completely absent <laughs> except for those those helicopters and dare i say one of russia's premier fixed wing aircraft we're not talking about a an su-25 frogfoot that got blown out we're talking about a premier awacs now, I think Russia has probably about five operational AWAC aircraft, which are similar in capacity to what the Americans have. But the Americans have far more of them because they've got a global presence, and the Russians have far fewer of them because their economy is much smaller. <laughs> and it's going to take them a few, you know, decades. tens of millions of dollars and maybe a decade to 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 actually build another one from, from the ramshackle industry that they're, they're saddled with. So yeah, something went significantly wrong. And again, we have to come back to the fact that either the Russians are incompetent or there was a conspiracy of partial support for Prigozhin's move, which kept most of the Russian military at bay and let Prigozhin take the lead. So either either or situation does not bode well for Putin because if if his military is so incompetent that they can't see the obvious and prevent it from happening and turning into a political crisis. That's a problem for Putin. If, if uh, you know, if if uh, Prigozhin has senior support among the rank and file of the Russian army and they let him go through, well, that's a problem as well. 
Maybe you remember at the beginning of that invasion and, and fighting, all the military experts in the world were asking, where is the Russian Air Force? You know, because yeah. if you have like hundreds of planes, sure, there is a military presence on the ground which can destroy your air force. But still, you know, after, let's say, at how many, like six or, or five months, the Gerasimov said that we are totally in control of Ukrainian military airspace. And still the Russian jets were not going inside of the Europe of the Ukrainian airspace, but they were just going around fire missile comeback, you know. So mm -hmm. I think this also confirms that there is something wrong in terms of military strategy. You're right. <clears throat> but the thing that uh, there, there are two things against the Russian Air Force that your, your your audience need to understand. And the first one is you know, the way that Russian pilots are trained, they don't get sufficient training, first and foremost. Uh, their fighter pilots get about half of the training of an average American pilot, which means with less time in the cockpit, that means that their capacities in terms of being able to fight a modern war are slightly restricted in terms of what they can bring to the table and skills. And that, that that's not just pilots, but also air crews that service the planes when they come back from a mission. But there is the, the other uh, problem with the Russian Air Force, and that is that um, the Americans, they have a speciality in their Air Force, uh, suppression of air defenses. The Russians never really focused on suppression of air defenses. You know, they, they go after the interceptor and, you know, the standoff bombers and all that kind of really cool stuff. But they've never really been into getting a plane designed that can go under the radar and knock out enemy air defenses, which would then clear a path for the heavy bombers and the fighters to come through unopposed. Now, without that capacity, what would happen is that if the current Russian Air Force went flying blindly into Ukraine, exercising their dominance, they could shut out of the sky by Ukrainian air defenses, because the West has provided Ukraine with some of the world's best air defenses and in the initial uh stage of the conflict there were many russian fighter planes that got shot out of the sky and i think the calculation was made in moscow well how many fighter planes do we actually have okay we got 400 how many did we lose oh we lost about uh, about 100 it's like well let's let's you know cool our heels with regard to the manned air force because obviously uh we can't afford to have any more losses because every Russian aircraft is expensive. Every Russian aircraft is maybe in excess of, say, 30 million American dollars. And again, because a lot of the more modern Russian fighter planes, they have uh, parts that come from Germany, parts that come from France, parts that come from China, parts that come from all over the world. It's not like Russians can crank them out of their own factory, fully 100% Russian built. They're not. So again, you've got to be careful with what you poured into the fray. And if you're afraid of losing your fighter planes, you just don't use them. Is there any connection between the Wagner Group and Russian FSB, Lublanka people? What do you Ah, yes. Look, I think that there are connections, but those connections aren't clear. They're, they're not clear. I think that they're sort of like a client relationship you know wagner gets fed information from official russian sources whether it be you know the fsb whether it be the gru when it's necessary for them to know i think that in that sense feeding wagner intelligence has been something that the kremlin has been doing on an as-need basis but they haven't opened up the supplies of intelligence and just said, well, look, I, you know, Prigozhin and your stooges out there, you know, you can have whatever you like. You know, I don't think it's that sort of relationship. I think it's a very closely guarded relationship in terms of the way that the, um, the FSB and the GRU operate and various other elements of Russian intelligence, because they don't want to over, uh, overdo their ties with Prigozhin and give him too much success. He's had enough so far. I think if if there was a if it were revealed that those ties were far more official and far tighter, um, again, I think that this could reflect really badly on Putin. The last question for today's interview: Why Wagner Group went to Belarus, and what do you think is going to be the implication of that movement? 
having Wagner in Belarus, because there are more camps on international arena. The first one is calculating with sort of like attack on Kiev coming from the north. The second camp is saying, oh, they will regroup, maybe strengthen and then fly to Africa or, or, or somewhere. And the next camp is, you know, calculating with like, it's, it's unclear, but maybe Wagner Group will keep an eye on Belarus, you know, to, to deter the European Union or Americans, you know, that, oh, in Belarus there are nuclear weapons, now there is Wagner Group. So country is getting like much stronger in terms of military or in terms of the power capabilities. So what are your thoughts? On there are many different interesting scenarios with regard to stationing Wagner forces in Belarus, one of which you've covered off on. Another from my colleagues suggests that maybe this whole thing was a ruse in um you know, uh, in the in the Prigozhin mutiny, maybe it wasn't a mutiny at all. Maybe Putin and Prigozhin organized the whole thing in a way to uh, destabilize Western thinking and strategy, and and the Ukrainians in particular. Um, I find that a little hard to believe. I think that I follow the Occam ra uh, Occam's razor. Uh, view of things you know usually it's the simplest explanation that will give you the real explanation and i'm not into the conspiracy but you know it's it is possible you you will have to calculate that out um you know there's obviously the idea of being able to put wagner on the border with poland and and monster poland in particular because poland has been arguably the most vocal um supporter of ukraine and nato um, and is a pivotal state for Europe's ongoing support of Ukraine. So, you know, maybe it's a it's a sign of trying to intimidate Warsaw. Um, there is another theory, and again, I'm I'm we'll have to wait this one out. But the theory is that Wagner will start conducting grey zone operations in and among the Baltic states to the north of Belarus, which I think is a very interesting scenario i just don't know whether i buy it but of course the horror show scenario for putin is that wagner with his fighters even sitting among i think there are about fifty thousand russian soldiers sitting in belarus anyway not only guarding the nuclear weapons they've just transferred but also keeping the lukashenko dictatorship upright that perhaps uh you know the uh <laughs> the wagner forces are going to form a base uh in in belarus and they will make another run for moscow at some point you know that that's the nightmare for for putin um I, I, at the outside of things one final scenario is that lukashenko's ability to make this deal happen may actually favor lukashenko and his dictatorship you know prior to the war lukashenko had been a freewheeling dictator he dealt with the EU when he had to, dealt with Russia when he had to. He was always part of the Russian orbit. I mean, there was no doubt about that. But he was he was given more latitude, more sovereignty to act. But since the war, Lukashenko has been, you know, held down by Russia. You are part of Russia, you know. And I think that Lukashenko's instinct as a dictator would be, I really want to get Putin's boot off my neck. How How could I do it? Oh, let's invite the Wagner forces in. And, you know, let's negotiate with him and we'll see what we can do. And maybe maybe they can do something to to subvert Russian forces already in Belarus. So, again, it could it could all turn really badly for Putin, depending on which of these scenarios you choose to believe. But it is a freewheeling and, dare I say, fluid situation. And we just have to watch the space to see how it all turns out. It is almost in many ways like a soap opera. <laughs> John, thank you very much for your time, for your insightful thoughts and, and analysis about the Wagner Group, about the conflict in Ukraine, Russia, Yevgeny Prigozhin and private military contractors. I'm very thankful that you found your time for our viewers and I wish you all the best to your work, to your research and we are waiting for more articles coming from your international think tank and also uh, good luck with your podcast because it's very important to bring information it's very important to put information under sort of like academic critical review so we are talking not only about pros but also about cons and that gives a perspective to our students and international audience to research international security much more to think even out of the theoretical perspectives like we said at the last question 
what's gonna happen with Wagner in Belarus, you know. It's not just that a fantasy to, to put like few scenarios, but this is how the military strategy is basically forming. So John, thank you very much for your for your contribution. Really greatly appreciate it and good luck with your projects, research and podcast. Thank you very much, Martin. It was a pleasure being with you. See you later. Bye.